I want to start getting into the discussion of if we're having repeat freak accidents, then it's not a freak accident. It's a design of the system and let's change that system. And so um, uh, what you see here on the screen is an accumu accumulation of crashes over the last five years in downtown Chattanooga. We know where the red spots are. What are we doing differently in those spots today to, to lower or to, to lighten that color? And the answer is nothing. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is John John Wesolowski from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, John John is actually an urbanist, the happy urbanist, and he is running for city council there in Chattanooga. Uh, so we are gonna be having a conversation about uh, the origins of how he got engaged with urbanism and trying to make more people-oriented places and what motivated him to run for city council. So let's get right to it with John John. John John, so wonderful to have you on the Active Towns channel. Welcome. Yes, thank you for having me. Uh, it feels exciting to, to be a part of this right now. Hey, John John, uh, you and I have a lot to catch up on. We uh, had an opportunity to hang out a bit in Cincinnati in May, uh, but let's do this for the audience. Uh, just take a moment to introduce yourself. So who the heck is John John? Hey, uh, my name is John John Wasilowski. I go by the Happy Urbanist online and Honestly, I, I feel like I'm a pretty regular person that has gone very deep down the urbanism rabbit hole. And what I found was the further I went down, the smaller my group of peers became, the more esoteric the language became. And I wanted to flip that funnel on its head. I wanted to create a larger group of people that I could talk about cities and city design and transit problems. And so I started creating content that was approachable, that wasn't specific to um, uh, a certain political group or region, and that kind of caught on. And so I've kind of grown a community online and started locally with some um, organization and activism to help make cities better places. I love it. Love it. And here's your logo, the happy urbanist. <laughs> and that's how we first met is, is basically online. I just started following you. You started following Active Towns. And, and, uh, and, and yes, it was just an absolute delight to be able to uh, connect with you. Uh, at the Strong Towns National Gathering, um, I stayed on and, and also attended CNU. Were you able to attend CNU or did you, were you just there for the Strong Towns National Gathering? No, I was, I was there. I was there for CNU. Um, but, uh, I, I did like, I, I did reach like a threshold of exhaustion. And so I, I was like in my hotel room in between talks, not as much socialization. I partied too hard at strong towns. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's a lot, you know, with, with the two of them mashed together like that, uh, the past two years, in fact, I've got my, uh, my coffee mug from, uh, the, the year prior there in Charlotte and, um, it's a long week, you know, it's almost like sensory overload just because you're like really, um, you know, you're talking constantly, you're meeting people. Sometimes you're meeting people that previously you've really only met before, uh, like this, you know, us, you know, you know, we, you know, in an online type of setting or social media type of setting. Um, to me, that's, what's really, really special about going to conferences. Um, I've been doing this for, oh gosh, the better part of 15 years now in the urbanist world. And so I, it's gotten to the point where the most ah, beneficial, the most impactful, the most rewarding parts of these conferences is actually just meeting people and getting together and socializing the in-between times. Um, occasionally I'll, I'll make sure that I attend a presentation like I did with yours. And that was awesome. <laughs> do you do you kind of do you notice that too? Is that you know a, a lot of the impactful stuff is is not only the sessions but also that time to interact. One hundred percent. But something I found is you can't always force those interactions. Like uh, there was a conversation with um, our with John Anderson that Chuck Marone and Edward Euphert like join that conversation and it was completely spontaneous. It didn't happen. It wasn't planned. And so what, what's interesting is like, you can't say no uh, to the in-between times because that's where the magic happens. And that's where I got exhausted was like 
man, we had dinner till 10 p.m. and then went to a running group. And then, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah that is that. That is absolutely so true. So I pulled up your website for The Happy Urbanist. You had mentioned that this is really your landing pad for uh, interacting and giving folks an opportunity to uh, to interact with other cities. And in fact, you can see the little button there of bring me to your city uh, is where you're there because you do get invited to speak in other communities and and share that message that you were sharing at the Strong Towns National Gathering. Um, why the heck would they do that? Why, why do they want to bring John John, the happy urbanist, to their community? I think there's a gulf between professionals that practice urbanism, um, decision makers who uh, hold the keys to things getting done, and then a, a third group of people who are most affected by urbanism. And what I see myself as is a sort of idea translator in the same vein as um as someone like Jane Jacobs, who is not a practicing engineer or even an architect, but someone who takes in qualitative data and tells stories. And so um, a good portion of what I want to do is help city councilors and city planners not just know that what they're doing is correct, but know how to communicate it to their um you know, to their citizens on how this is helpful to them and why they're making these types of decisions. So um, if I do come to your city, like I want to come and film videos that I'll post on my channel to highlight whatever you're trying to highlight. Um, I also do want to come and, uh, you know, speak to um, not just professionals in a closed room, but to a larger audience of people who might have questions about what's going on and why is this happening or why should we be thinking about reducing lanes on a street in the middle of a downtown or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I pulled up um, the Instagram post here from the Chattanooga Urbanist Society. Explain who the Chattanooga Urbanist Society, that's easy for me to say. Explain who the Chattanooga Urbanist Society actually is. Yeah. So the Chattanooga Urbanist Society has a funny origin story where um, there was a guardrail taken out on a bridge that left pedestrians who were walking by vulnerable to a 25 foot drop and it just wasn't getting fixed. It was probably a state route within the city and there was just a work order that put in and they just put up caution tape to keep someone from falling. And I remember thinking like the city should have done something at least for the pedestrians. It could have been wood, it could have been temporary, but something should have been done. And then I remember thinking, well, I should do something. And at the point I decided to do something about it, I didn't want to get credit for it because I didn't know if I would get in trouble. But I also didn't want the city to get credit for it because they hadn't done anything. So I created in my head what was a fake group um, with a logo and I stenciled it on anything that, that was getting put into place and I put up a guardrail. Um, and actually, if you go to the Instagram and in one of the first posts, you'll see that guardrail that was fixed. And I posted a video about it from anonymous point of view on a, on a channel with zero followers. And that first video got 150,000 views in a week. And so it was like, okay, maybe this fake group is actually going to become a real group. And it since has become that. So we've done all sorts of events. Our main sort of flagship program is we're increasing seating um, and benches around the city and um, we build benches for bus stops. So that's actually our flagship bench design. Most of them are made from dumpster wood, but all have a very similar look. And um, we've built upwards of 90 of them throughout the city, um, doing about 10 to 20 a month at this point. And um, that's, yeah, the Urbanist Society, uh, we just received a, uh, a, at the state of the city, the mayor gave the Chattanooga Urbanist Society an award. And what I love about this is we are not an organization. We're just a mutual aid group. We're not a 501c3. You can't donate to us. You can give us stuff. We'll take it. But you're not going to get to get it as a write-off. It's I tell people we have more in common with three raccoons in a trench coat than we do with an actual organization. And um, so what's cool is what you're seeing right now was um, an art installation where an artist took our bench. Um, made it beautiful and then put it under uh, under this theme of boldly taking up space. That's what the whole gallery was about. And um, so, yeah, you'll see a lot of benches being built, but you'll also see things of like being critical of um, some of the decisions our city has made um, in regards to the homeless population or pedestrian safety. And so the Urbanist Society has um, 
has really been like a local incubator for change in, in the cityscape. Nice, nice. Yeah, and, and that's what really impressed me about you and your presentation that you gave at the Strong Towns National Gathering is just how organic and um, not asking permission to do stuff and, and, and really just kind of taking control. I mean, obviously, you know, maybe that th- first 311 call or, or, or post, you know, I, I'm assuming you guys use 311 in, in the city of Chattanooga to report uh, things that need to be done. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to try to use the system and, and try to, you know, get the, the city to respond. Dude, we, we need a bench at this bus stop. I mean, come on, this is inhumane that we don't have this. Or, you know, hey, this guardrail is very, very dangerous. We need a, a safer situation here for, for people. Um, and, and so you, you're, you're just not shy about, okay, that's clearly not working. How can we be more creative about this? How can we use like the spirit of tactical urbanism of just pinpointing and doing something and making it happen? And, uh, and I love the fact that you, you know, used a little bit of, of humor to, to, to this as well and creating a fake society and, and just putting it out there because then it, it, it like creates this momentum of identification of that. Oh, wow. This is like a community effort, which is what this is really all about. Yeah. It was a real, if, if you build it, they will come type of moment where people who wanted to be a part of it. And here, here's the thing is you have to create involvement at all levels of ability. Like if I just went out there and said, I need, you know, highly skilled craftsmen to build me beautiful benches that we can then set up around town. But instead we created events that was like, Hey, we're going to have a, 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 like na- a wood prepping event. If you can pull nails out of wood, show up. Uh, we're going to have a painting event. If you can paint, show up. Um, we're going to have a trash picking up event. And the idea is like this idea of including people at all levels Yes, part of it is about the people who sit on that bench and experience the ability to sit while they're waiting 45 minutes for the bus to show up. But also half of this is about the people who are actually doing the work and how they will be changed whenever they drive by and say, I helped make that bench or that place needs a bench. And my eyes are open to it in part because I've been working on this bench project. Um, So it's really cool that it cuts in both directions, that it's helping people as an end goal, but it's also changing the lives of those that that work together in it as well. Yeah, yeah. I went backwards to December uh, 6, 2022 to show that original uh, logo that you put together. And again, here's the, uh, the the barrier that you were talking about and the challenge that was there. And, and yeah, I mean, taking control, making it happen. I love it. It's good stuff. And yeah, just amazing. It's, it's also a lot of fun. And I think at the beginning, I, we were anonymous in part because we didn't know if we could get in trouble. But since being recognized by the mayor and different news outlets, we're pretty sure we're not going to get in trouble for a lot of this stuff. But we still use that anonymity because it's almost like we want people to see themselves in this action of like, no, like any individual project will heavily be anchored by one person who saw the vision for that project and led it. But instead of giving them the credit, it's a faceless set of hands that gets the credit in all the videos. And so we want people to be able to imagine like, oh, I could go put out a bench. I could go do this. And I hear that all the time where people are like, how do we open up a chapter of the Urbanist Society in our city? And we'll send them branding assets so they can create it for themselves. And then we just say, go build a bench, whatever, whatever you can. Even if you're setting up crates in a board, go build a bench, see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing that I really um, appreciated about your presentation there at the Strong Towns National Gathering was that sense of, of identifying opportunities to create community, to get people to like care about their places. And so the benches were a part, but there were other, you know, sort of strategic things. You know, it it reminded me a lot of like um, the little free libraries that you'll see around a a neighborhood. You know, you're walking and and it, it creates this sense of of sociability. And especially for people who are walking and biking, because 
if you're outside of a car, you notice this kind of stuff. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that zeitgeist, because that's very much a part of, of what makes your efforts like really, really special is that that sense of community. I, I think there was even like a kiosk or something like that. It was like a, a, a little free library on steroids or something in, in your presentation. Oh, yeah. Great, great call. out. Um, so it some of this comes back to an idea I got from Monty Anderson, um, who is in your home state goes to Strong Towns and we were talking about walkability scores and he said, you know, the only walkable score I care about. And I was like, what's that? He goes, if people are actually outside walking, do people inhabit that space? That's the true test of whether a space is walkable. And so what I like to think about is what are the reasons for people to be in that area? Um, and for most of our neighborhood, there's no reason to be outside of your home. There really isn't like dog walkers meet each other because their dog forces them outside um, people who are directly next door. But there isn't that sense of place that exists in most neighborhoods in America. And so um, when we're looking at the urbanist society and what we're doing is we're essentially trying to do some more placemaking. Um, and the free little library you're talking about was actually a, um, a community fridge. So it was food based, but it was anyone can add food to it anyone can take from it um but what was great about it is um if you're walking by you could take a picture upload that picture to your instagram story and that's helping people out that's letting people know like there's this needs to get cleaned or this food is available and what i found really powerful about that is um it increased chance encounters and interactions and community within that so yeah and we're scrolling through your Instagram now. So this is your Instagram. This is your um, Happy Urbanist uh, page here. And we saw just a moment ago, right when you were saying placemaking, uh, you know, an example of some of your more recent posts, you know, you know, really kind of calling out, you know, placemaking. We've got a whole mixture of different stuff here. And then we start to see, whoa, all the pretty pictures are starting to get, you know, lots of words in here. You're starting to get more activated in, in, you know, content creation and putting stuff out. I mean, it, it, it's like this walkable distance isn't necessarily walkable um, because, it, and, and this is one of the, the challenges I have, and I don't know if you're, I don't even remember this video, so I don't know if you're talking about this or riffing about it, but one of the things that really irks me about um, walk score and proximity uh, tools that really hone in on walkable distances and saying, oh, this place is incredibly walkable because the distance is the proximity is very close and without taking into consideration true walkability, which is, oh yeah, it may be, it may be close, but it, you can't get there from here because it's incredibly hostile. Actually, that video you were just showing was a perfect example. So that video on TikTok got over 10 million views. Um, and it was a very simple video. I was walking to a neighborhood pool, which was like 15 minutes away. Um, and so the distance was walkable and I was just naming, what am I coming across as I'm going? And I did not, this wasn't a heavily planned out video. I was meeting my family at the pool and my wife said, can you just be done with your phone for the night, you know, after work? And I was like, okay, I'll film myself walking to the pool and then I'll be done. And this is exactly what I think sort of, uh, you know, makes people swallow that blue pill where they realize like, oh, like something that's close by can have sidewalks the entire way and still technically not be walkable for X, Y, and Z reason. And that's exactly what the spirit of this video is. Um, I, I have some images of different spots in my city that were real places. And you see these black and white image under the regular neighborhood. And, um, uh, and one of them is actually on that street you just saw me walking on, but you could really choose any of those images. And what you'll notice is the sidewalk infrastructure hasn't changed between those two time periods. So if you go to the 1950s, oh, this is the perfect, this is exactly the one I wanted you to show. So this is the Ridgedale neighborhood in Chattanooga. It's a very suburban neighborhood, but it used to be a streetcar suburb. So it had its own little town center, right? And these two images, the sidewalks are the same. Um, 
And one of them is walkable and one isn't. Well, why is that? Well, one, you had a reason to be walking in one of them. You had stores and resources and third places. And the other one, you see it's a lot of empty lots. Um, And one of them, it was busy enough that the traffic moves slowly. And the other one, you'll see that it's a thoroughfare and cars go at incredibly fast speeds. So one of the things um, that I think is really novel that people open their eyes to is that you, you can't drop a sidewalk in a walkable block make. Like you have to do more than that. And, um, and what's magic about doing more than that is it doesn't take a lot of, I, I don't think initially it doesn't take a lot of top-down planning. It takes just removing restrictions, allow things to develop organically. Um, and that's really what, I, what I'm all about here, showing people like, this is what our neighborhood used to look like. There, it's so funny. You've traveled um, a lot. Last year, I was in Europe for seven and a half months. I always caught myself using the term downtown and Europeans didn't understand what I was talking about. Uh, and, and it's so funny because that's true of American cities pre-war is that we had lots of little downtowns. Um, you have lots of little neighborhood centers that rival what a, a downtown is in most American cities today. Yeah. Yeah. They would use typically centrum, uh, to mean the, the city center or the historic core. Some of the cities were, uh, depending on how old they were and, and whether they had any uh, Roman origin, there may have been a wall. Like if you visit Sevilla, Seville, you know, you've got the old historic wall that, you know, that was around the or- original city. Uh, many of the cities in the Netherlands uh, had a star pattern of the canals that were part of the fortress. So the city center, the old historic core. I say, I would say downtown all the time. And they were like, what are you talking about? Oh, the city center, the historic core. Oh, that's what you mean. <laughs> and it's funny to see how, um, oh, this, this is the street I was actually on in that neighborhood. And, um, what's interesting about this is whenever I show this picture, because, um, you, I don't know if you can quite tell one building is exactly the same on the left-hand side. It says like Tennessee awning company. It's been active for the last 50 years. Um, or 75 years, I should say, but 50 years since this picture was taken. And um, uh, what's interesting is that any neighbor I show agrees that what used to be there was better than what's there now, mostly just empty parking lots and chain link fences. Um, But whenever you get to an issue where zoning changes that will make that bottom picture possible come into play, people vote against it. And this is my whole MO, is just helping people understand If you want neighborhoods like you see in the bottom picture, um, then you're going to have to make decisions like that might mean narrowing roads or allowing for a mixed use development to be within a block of your house or something like that. Yeah. What's interesting, too, this is one of the first times I've seen like uh, an example of where we actually see one major, major improvement in the new version versus the old version. What am I talking about? Uh, you know, I, I, I may have missed it. What? It's the burying uh, of the utility lines. Oh, well, actually you, you say that they just moved one street over. <laughs> so uh. <laughs> they're not as, they're not as obnoxious on this street, but they do exist yeah. on the next street over. Because that's one of the pet peeves I have is that, you know, so often, you know, we've got these overhead utility lines and, you know, they're and what space are they taking up? Well, they're typically taking up pedestrian realm, you know, they're, or, you know, and it's and it's just so frustrating how oftentimes you're to, you, oh, we can't get there. You know, if you're with somebody who happens to be in a wheelchair because the, the you know, the pedestrian realm is impassable if somebody uh, is, is not able-bodied. Yeah. So actually, that's one of the biggest things that I use whenever I'm presenting the city council is the amount of people in mobility aids that use the bike lane. Um, because if you get to a curb that's not cut or a telephone pole that's in the middle, you have to backtrack. 300 feet to the next access point. So why not just ride, start a start off in the street to begin with? And that's um, incredibly popular um, in my city as well. 
Well, and, 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 and you bring up a really good point, too. And I try to, to emphasize this on the Active Towns channel all the time. When we look at cities that have incredibly high rates of people riding bikes for utilitarian purposes, uh, getting to their meaningful destinations, those networks, those cities that have been developed um, are incredibly comfortable for all ages and abilities. And the all abilities part of that phrase, all ages and abilities, also means that it's the preferred place for somebody in a mobility device, a wheelchair or other type of mobility device to want to be in. It's way smoother, more, more cohesive than it is to be, you know, sharing pedestrian realm. And so that's exactly what you see throughout the Netherlands and in Copenhagen and many other places like that, is you see that those, that cycle network is in fact um, a wheeling network that is, you know, supporting people who are on bikes or on mobility devices, on scooters of various types. Uh, and, it, and it's just part of an enhanced level of mobility for them. And, uh, and then you still have to have a very attractive and comfortable pedestrian realm as well. So I yep. just wanted to put and, that in there. And I saw that this summer in Chicago. Um, uh, obviously, Chicago has a long way to go to become you know, Denmark or anything like that. But in a few places, I saw some nice protected bike paths. Um, that's where I saw like it was truly multimodal. There was lots of different types of wheeled people going through that pathway. And then, of course, I saw that a lot uh, when I was in Belgium last year. So Belgium uh, seems to have gotten that right. I think of these as like um, as like are you familiar with the term indicator species in biology? And so that's something I, I like push with cities all the time is like these are your indicator species. If they're people who are here by choice, um, uh, then you're doing something right. Um, if they're people, who, if you only see people who are forced to be here um, in this format, then something is wrong. Um, and so uh, seeing someone with a mobility aid in an unsafe bike lane, that's, that's a negative indicator species. Um, but seeing somebody who's out with their family, you're having fun, you're probably going to see them in a great protected pathway. And that's a positive indicator species um, that you'd be looking for there as far as placemaking goes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and I say that a lot about women and children, you know, women, children, and the elderly, if you're seeing lots of women, children, and the elderly, um, you know, on bikes, you know, on their mobility devices, joyfully uh, getting around to their meaningful destinations, then you, that's your indicator species that you got the design right. Yeah. And that's um, one of the things uh, that we'll get to. Uh, I'm running for local office now. Uh, and one of the things is people are like, oh, isn't he the bike lane guy? Because I've, I've kind of been, I've been branded as someone who has advocated for pedestrian and cycling safety. And some people are like, well, you know, we don't have the luxury of riding bikes in this district or riding, you know, like that. That's something that people that wear Lycra and carbon fiber bikes, that's what they do on the other side of town. We don't have the luxury of doing that. And that's one of the myths I'm trying to dispel is like, um, the upward economic mobility of our district could be contingent on people safely getting access to opportunities they otherwise wouldn't safely have access to. Um, and uh, it's normal to see a white 30-year-old man riding in and out of traffic on a bi bicycle, but when it's so safe that a child that you can bring your children along on the bike ride, that's when you realize, OK, this is not just safe for children. It's safe for economic access. Uh, it's safe for delightful evenings with your friends. Um, it's safe for, you know, um, I don't know, boosting the local economy, increasing community. Uh, the, those things are are all parts of making a great multimodal pathway and connecting like neighborhoods and, and nodes throughout the city. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that concept of thinking of this as a multimodal pathway versus a bike lane. Um, a bike lane kind of conjures up an image uh, in the general population of, oh, yeah, we're, why are we doing that? Why are we, you know, going bending over backwards to create infrastructure for that dude in Lycra, nothing against dudes in Lycra. I'm a dude. Sometimes I wear Lycra. Um, you know, I've got my racing bike as well. Yes. But 
to, to, to your point, you know, those people are actually those people, me, you know, I'm comfortable just riding on the, on the shoulder of, uh, you know, of a country road. In fact, it's, it's absolutely delightful to be able to do that. And I'm comfortable riding in traffic too, but that's not what we're building mobility, multi-user mobility infrastructure for. We're building safe and inviting all ages and abilities cycle networks so that we can do just like what we said earlier, make it truly safe and inviting for all ages and abilities to be able to use that. And so it really kind of shifts that conjuring of what the stereotypical person we're talking about when we're saying we're building um, this infrastructure for. And I think it goes even beyond that. So in in Chattanooga, there is a heavily pedestrianized area um, called Fraser Avenue. And the longest pedestrian bridge uh, in the U.S. dumps people from downtown into the North Shore right on Fraser Avenue in Chattanooga. And there's little shops there. It's fun to walk there. Um, uh, but it's a four to five lane strode that cuts through there. And it's incredibly dangerous. Um, this one building that got hit last year has been hit eight times since the year 2000. Uh, last year, there were 37 vehicle incidents on this like four to five blocks of road from the street side parking. And we even got federal grants eight years ago to make it right. And the businesses were against right sizing it and adding bike facilities. And that kept it from happening. And then last year, there was an incredible tragedy where an entire family was hit and two out of the three family members died, including a small child. And that was a wake up call. And that that road is now getting treatment. But even after it was decided that that road would be right size, the businesses came out against bike lanes and bike facilities. And, and if you drill down and ask them why, they were saying, well, the cyclists are annoying. They're always on the sidewalks. They're you're like, well, why are they on the sidewalks? Why? Why do you think? People on the segways and electric skateboards are running into your patrons on the sidewalks. There's no safe way for them. And their sort of counter proposal was to have a cycling pass through the park behind the buildings. So, so the cyclists needed to get somewhere they, they could bypass the area. And I realized they don't see cyclists as shoppers. They don't see cyclists as people with wallets. And so that's where we had to start this campaign that like you don't get paid by cars driving by, but by wallets coming through the door. Right. And someone on a bike um, who's more likely to notice your shop because they're moving at a slow speed and is more likely to stop because it's not a hassle to park um, are way better shoppers than someone who's trying to go home from work taking the fastest way possible. And, and, and that was a huge paradigm shift. And in all honesty, the studies were on our side and we could show those studies all day, but it took analogies, anecdotes, illustrations, stories to show cyclists are shoppers. <laughs> like cyclists can help run your business and you want them coming by your front door. You don't want some path around the back. So, um, well, and, and if I can jump in and just say this, it's like part of the challenge that we have in trying to um, to help businesses, business owners see this is is for us to even change our language and not even call them cyclists. I mean, yeah. what we're really talking about is people. We're trying to create a people oriented place so that people, people, people who might be walking, people who might be riding a bike, people who might be in a wheelchair, mobility device can get to your business and and interact with your business. The second thing is, is that there's oftentimes, and you know this, and maybe you're about to talk about this, is that there's this misperception that all 100% of my customers come by car. Mm. And that's just an erroneous perspective because you don't really know how people are coming. That may be the case if you're a completely in a completely car dependent location. But if you're in a location that is, you know, quote unquote, Main Street USA, where, you know, a hundred and some odd years ago before the automobile took over, you know, this was a place that was thriving because it was an attractor for people getting there. Um, and, and, and we've allowed the automobile to take over, then, you, you know, you have an opportunity. To, to really kind of lean into the fact that, as you mentioned, it's wallets walking through the door, <laughs> not cars driving past. 
And, and that's something we also tried to bring up was that if you look at the street itself, Fraser Avenue, the south side of the street is full of shops and those shops are thriving. Rent is high. Right across the street, the shops are um, a little bit more dead, a little bit slower, and uh, and a lot more vacancies on the north side of the street. And it's because the street is unsafe to cross on, and the pedestrians are coming from downtown and to the and from the park, and to the point where there's even a parking garage on the other side of the street. So there's 300 parking spaces on the north side, but what you see instead are people crossing mid block to get to the south side of the street because that's where the buildings are, that's where people are, um, and that side of the street is brought alive by individuals and people. So um, it, it is it is interesting. We'll see how it all plays out. But what's so powerful about this moment is that we are going to do this street correctly. And after five blocks, the street turns into a state route. And it's going to be much more likely that the state route will add bike facilities to match the urban fabric that we've created. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the idea of getting involved locally is that um, we're creating roadmaps for how other cities can influence, you know, their state department of transportation, who has huge say, especially in southern cities, and how your urban fabric is laid out. Fantastic. Okay, so yes, you have made the decision to, to run for city council. Uh, this is your landing page for um, your uh, campaign. Uh, talk us a little bit. Talk us through a little bit about uh, when the election is, and what really prompted you to want to throw your hat in the ring for this. Yeah, there's a recent Atlantic article slash podcast uh, by Jerusalem Dimsis, who who said something that I'm having a hard time accepting. So one, they're a wonderful writer and uh, really on top of uh, topics that have to do with cities and urbanism. But essentially what they're calling for almost seems like a retreat from local politics. They're saying we've wanted to engage with local politics because it feels the most democratic. It feels like you have the most influence there. But because those elections aren't highly um, attended, perhaps the most democratic thing is to move to the state and the federal level. And so there's, they're sort of like prescribing this retreat from local politics. Let's fix zoning on the state level. That to me feels like the privilege of a more progressive or like uh, a forward thinking state like New Jersey. But that isn't going to be something that happens anytime soon in Tennessee, where I live. And here, um, the local control is going to be where it most likely happens. So my decision to run for local politics was really based on two things. Um, if it can be done, I want to see if we can do it. And if we can do that as an example to cities in the American South to say, you don't have to wait till you're a you know, left coast blue city. In fact, there are many reasons within a conservative vernacular for increasing property rights as it are as it is to, to, to increase affordable housing and things like that. So one is to be that example. Two is to realize the power of community and experimentation in cities that feel underfunded. And here's what I mean by that is Every city councilor is fighting for a small piece of pie when it comes to the budget. And I think I should do that as a city council. I should fight for the resources for my district. But it's underutilized to see city council members activating their community towards more tactical actions. And um, so uh, one example of this is in my community. I'm not a city councilor yet, but I'm just doing this as a private citizen, is I've applied for a grant to make a safe pathway to school in my neighborhood. And um, I've gotten friends who've worked for the city to draw up MUTCD compliant plans. Um, we're looking at local um, foundations to match that grant. But when we win the grant, there is no pathway for the city to get this done. We're gonna have to do it ourselves with the permission of the city. But if we're able to pull this off and create a sort of paper pathway for others to follow, Essentially, what we've unlocked is the ability to have official tactical urbanism in a city that hasn't really done that before. And so um, that's the second thing I'm really running on is the ability to empower the community to shape itself, uh, regardless of what funding it does or doesn't get. Right. And if I click on your, your priorities, here we are 
on that. We've got infrastructure, neighborhoods, and communities, and housing are your three big buckets that you have. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> priorities. It's time for deeds, not words. I mean, that's a big part of your entire zeitgeist in terms of the types of thing, things that you have been doing uh, is, yeah, it's, it's not just time to talk about it. And it's also not time to necessarily just ask permission about it. Let's, let's, let's do some stuff. You just said it there again, is, is that tactical, you know, let's have that spirit of let's get it out there. Let's trial this. Let's move quickly on some of these, uh, you know, installations and, and interventions. And the closing speaker for strong towns this year was a city planner named Barka Patel. Um, who I now like consider a friend. And Barca, when she was talking about what they did in Jersey City to achieve Vision Zero, it was action. It was use what you have. Uh, the only green paint we have is used for tennis courts. Well, we're going to use it. Um, we've made bike lanes safe enough that anyone can ride on them, but not everyone's riding on them. What can we do? Well, we're, we're going to add a ponytail to the cyclist symbol so that people can see this isn't just for 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 you know, the dudes. guys and like the yeah. dudes, yeah, the, the yeah. ongoing joke of, of us. And so um, what I find so inspiring about that is that a city has shown that there is more than just two narratives when it comes to safety and infrastructure. Right now, the, 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 the narrative is this. Anything that happens is a tragedy as a result of um, a freak accident. What could we do? Or human error what can we do like if this person was wearing bright clothing this wouldn't have happened if this person wasn't day drinking this wouldn't have happened so there's a human error and then there's a freak accident oh this is a one in a million thing yeah oh, it was just it, it was one of those things it was just like you know who knew yeah and and this is where i want to start getting into the discussion of if we're having repeat freak accidents, then it's not a freak accident. It's a design of the system and let's change that system. And so um, uh, what you see here on the screen is an accum accumulation of crashes over the last five years in downtown Chattanooga. We know where the red spots are. What are we doing differently in those spots today to, to lower or to, to lighten that color? And the answer is nothing. Um, the answer is, people need to stop speeding in those areas or people need to pay attention in those areas or not look at their phone in those areas. But we know where they are, we can target them. And that's really what I wanna be about is taking this sort of action and the next right foot forward. It's also changing the conversation that's happening, right? It's like, we've, we basically have 70 to 80 years of having the narrative shaped by what you were just talking about as blaming the victim or blaming the nut behind the wheel. Um, it's that human air perspective, the human air orientation versus the built environment orientation of this is the way that we've built this. We looked at, you know, several examples of, of, you know, streetscapes and you described, you know, the, of the strode going through. I mean, we have built a system that is delivering expected results. This is not an accident. This is an expected result. Um, and so that's an incredibly important thing to, to realize and to embrace, I think. And, and it's hard for people to understand that these hotspots, this is not just where, you know, the inattent inattentive people congregate. This is this is because of the design of the infrastructure that's there. And we can change that. And in a city, the thing that absolutely destroys vitality and vibrancy and safety and inviting and welcoming environments is motor vehicle speed. Yeah. And, and it's so interesting that you 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 bring that up because your experience uh, overseas probably affirms this and that other city planners recognize this. And, and one of the things I've, I've, I've tried to tell people because like in, again, I'm in the American South, I'm not using the same language that someone would use in the Bay area. So in the, you know, someone's going to sit here and talk about why well, I need to be able to get to work. And then, and, and they make it about like a personal rights issue. And I'm like, look, there are two rights at play. Your right to speed through my neighborhood is usurping 
my right for my kids to play safely in my street. And so what we need to come to is, is this idea that it's not just about one set of rights that are being infringed upon when we reduce lanes downtown or something like that. But instead, it's a conversation about what is this neighborhood actually for? What are we supposed to be doing here? And, um, and when you frame the conversation like that, I think you actually get a different dialogue than just three lanes good, five lanes bad, you know, right. yeah. Um, yeah. you start framing it around like, what are we supposed to be doing in this location? And does the street design bring about that benefit, those benefits? And something you said earlier, because you talked about the indicator species of the old, the young, having a good time. That's also been really helpful for me whenever someone gets hit and the narrative is they were looking at their phone or they're drunk or something like that. What I like to say is, okay, a drunk individual is simulating the awareness of a child. And so I, what I tell people is what we need in public spaces are streets so safe kids can play in them. And when we have that, it'll also be safe for the phone zombie that's not paying attention um, or, you know, the person that is over imbibed on a, on a Saturday evening. And what I tell people is like, we should look at the most vulnerable people for whatever reason as a simulation um, for the people we care about the most. And I think personally, both lives are equally worthy, but saying streets so safe children can play in them um, rings differently for, for a certain group of people. Yeah. Yeah. I, this image that you uh, shared, this pair of images here, um, I'll have you describe it for the listening only audience as well. But one of the words that you just use there that, you know, people will oftentimes, uh, you know, bring up or the narratives they'll bring up is don't inf infringe upon my freedoms, you know, to be able to drive, you know, anywhere I want to go as fast as I want to go. You know, you're 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 infringing on my my rights to be able to do so. And I like to, to reframe that and say, well, actually, what we're, we're talking about here is trying to uh, create freedom of movement. We're talking, you know, being able to, to live in a place that's kind of like on the left hand side of this, uh, this image here uh, looks like if we if we get the design right and it's truly a safe and inviting environment within reasonable distances, it looks like 2000 feet here is, is the distance that we're looking at. That to me is is like the the ultimate in freedom because you have hopefully that that option of mobility choice, but uh, that may not be the framing that you have for this particular uh, set of images. Uh, take it away. W what are we looking at here, and why did you want to share this with the audience? Yeah, I got this image from Victor Dover, who gave me permission to share it, use it on social, and it's one of my favorite images. So it shows two thousand feet of road, um, and a similarly wide road. So. When you look at this and you look at the direct resources, both of these images are using the same amount of resources, 2,000 feet of asphalt for what is, I think, a 32-foot wide road. In one image, you see a downtown. I believe it's uh, uh, in Virginia with lots of buildings close together. You see some green there, so you got to imagine there's a park in there. Um, there's a church that is sort of the terminating vista, so the street ends at that church. And then on the other image... You have what is six or seven structures with lots of yard in between, maybe a couple houses, but some businesses. And this really is telling a couple of stories. So one, the story you were just selling. If you were to ask about the freedom of choice and you walk out of any of those buildings, which one gives you more access to more things? It's the one where the mixed use, dense, densely brought together place is. Yeah. Um, and, second, and granted, this is gentle density too. Let's, let's, yeah. you know, but oh, for those yeah, people yeah. who for, they hear the word density and they're just, yeah. oh my God, this is terrible. Yeah. You're talking about Two to three story buildings. Yeah. Th yeah. This is gentle. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. And obviously there's tree canopy along the street that um, is, you know, so, so that's the first thing is like, which one. Um, so the first, the first question is which one gives you more choices whenever you walk out the door. The second question I ask people is which one do you think developed as a result of choices versus restrictions. So on the right-hand side where you see a lot of yards and big parking lots, um, that's, a, that's a result of policy, of saying you have to have so many setbacks. You have min maximum lot coverage. Um, you can't use this type of building in this area. And that's what it did. And then the third question, and I think this is the most important one, is I ask, 
which one of these generates tax revenue that can afford that 2,000 square feet of asphalt? And the, the, the exact right answer to that is the left one, the one with the gentle density. Um, and so uh, anytime you talk about this, you got to talk about Urban 3 and the work they do. Um, the image that's pulled up right now is a simulation of that. So I asked the question, who pays Chattanooga bill, Chattanooga's bills? And when you visualize the data, you see that downtown disproportionately s- subsidizes the suburbs. And we've essentially outlawed the type of development that brings in that type of revenue. Um, and so what I, what I like to make with those three points is the individual on the street of the gentle dense, with the, of the neighborhood with gentle density, they have more choice and more options. Therefore, they have more freedom. Um, the owners of the land of, of that area have more freedom and rights of what they can do with their land. And as a result, they inherit more, um, more services and more wealth as a result of the, the economic engine that those two that those two street or that that one street shows over the other. So, yeah, I, I think that's that's a really good thing to to, you know, emphasize and to give additional context to that. You had mentioned the image on the right here, the spread out development pattern. Uh, you mentioned the cost of the, the road, you know, of that 2000 feet of road. We also have to think of all the other infrastructure that's there underneath the road. You've got the barrier, the sewer lines and all of that. And so part of what really brings home how powerful this revenue, uh, tax revenue per acre analysis that um, Urban 3 has done, you've duplicated here by data that you were able to get publicly is just that point is that the further out that we spread ourselves out, there's no way for us to actually tax those far out places, those landowners enough to be able to bring in enough money to cover the long-term obligation of that infrastructure when those water pipes go bad, when the sewer lines go bad, when the road needs to be repaved. You know, we're we're getting new water mains and sewer pipes in our neighborhood here, which was platted in the 1930s. And so, you know, a lot of that infrastructure, you know, is getting, you know, pretty darn close to 100 years old. It's crumbling. It needs to be replaced. And so we're going through that painful exercise of doing that. It's a heck of a lot easier to be able to afford as a city, this is really good for a a potential city council member to understand, is that, yeah, if we are in, if we have more places that are in the green here that are bringing in more tax revenue per acre, um, we can actually have a better chance of being able to afford that ongoing obligation and maintenance. It also brings in the fact that being able to develop more closely to the development pattern of the left side of this, where we do have that gentle density versus the right side where everything is sort of sprawling and spread out, the more likely that the city coffers are going to have the money in the future, assuming the city does a good job of like putting that money aside to be able to to pay for you know that future obligation, there's a whole another thing that that Chuck talks about where cities aren't doing that, but that's another discussion. Well, <laughs> so. and that, that, and that's the thing. What you said reminded me of, of two anecdotes. The first one I think I got from Hayden Clarkin, the the transit guy, and he brought up that uh, Nashville is 13 times the size of Barcelona in land and like footprint, but a similar size population. You can't afford sewer lines, 13 times uh, power lines, things of that nature. And Chattanooga is lucky. For every one person that moves out of Chattanooga, three are moving in. If anyone can afford um, to thrive as a city, it should be a growing city like Chattanooga. Yeah, and Austin too. Yeah. Yeah. And our problem is we have 2,500 lane miles of road. And on a good year, we will pave 60 to 70 miles. And if you do the math, that comes out to like 32 years. We need some of these roads to last. 40 years, we need these roads to last. And I talked to an engineer and I said, how long are these roads designed to last? He's like, 25 years is stretching it. 
15 to 20 years is normal for some of these roads. And so it's just like, even as a city that's, that is punctuated with growth, if the growth pattern is working backwards, then scaling up makes things worse, not better. So, so if, if the growth pattern is causing debt, then increasing that pattern makes the problem worse. And that's yeah. something that we're So g- give a little bit of a, a, a context to the setting there in Chattanooga. I'm, I've never visited Chattanooga. I need to get there. I need to uh, spend some time on the ground with you. Um, I have been to Memphis, though, and so I understand the, the, the situation in Memphis. Memphis, just like Austin, grew exponentially back in the day and sprawled out to massive, massive levels. And then, of course, had the the, the city center and the core uh, go through really, really getting hollowed out and, and having difficult times. Uh, that sense has started to change and the medical district is one of the areas, the neighborhoods that are, are coming around. And there's lots of um, lots of wonderful folks like Roshan Austin there in South Memphis, who's doing some great stuff there. Uh, but what's the what's the situation there in Chattanooga? Do, are you guys relatively compact or did you all sprawl out as well? Yeah. So uh, Chattanooga in 1969 was um, named by Walter Cronkite, the dirtiest city in America. Okay. Um, we, we have a skyline. In what defining, context? Yeah. Well, we're a, an industrial city okay. that was in a valley. And so it, like what I've heard from someone, I actually, he, he was um, uh, one of the original members of, of CNU. And he was telling me when he lived in Chattanooga in the 60s, that most days you couldn't see the mountain, the mountain being Lookout Mountain. Now, Lookout Mountain um, is right downtown. Like it, like the foot of it scoops into downtown. So you're sitting here thinking like you can't see that mountain most days. And so it was a dirty, polluted city that has turned itself around first and foremost in the 90s by focusing on its downtown area, making a world class sort of area. So Chattanooga has branded itself as a beautiful place, both in natural resources and in its like downtown core. And that's true. Like if you, people that visit Chattanooga tend to have a positive view of it. But what's happened is there's developed two Chattanoogas, the one you visit and the one you live in. The one you visit has a pedestrian bridge that spans the river. Um, And uh, actually, what's really interesting about this map is you see the city outline and then you see that little donut in the middle. It looks like a um, it's that's the city of Red Bank. So Chattanooga started sprawling so much that a town incorporated and Chattanooga just kept spreading and went all the way around it. There's three communities that Chattanooga has subsumed that um, Red Bank is a whole city. There's one called Ridgeside that's literally a neighborhood um, and then one called East Ridge. And so what happened and which, is- by, by the way, Austin did that as well. Okay, and so, cool. it, so it was, it, it was, and again, a lot of a lot of cities do this. It's that process of you know going out and continuing to annex in more and more land, especially when that land has uh, has already been allowed to develop in sometimes unincorporated areas, sometimes historic villages. Um, but the development, you know, pattern like started exploding and they might be in the area of like the utility and police and fire uh, service district. But because it's not officially part of the city, the city doesn't get any of those taxes. And so cities are oftentimes very incentivized to try to annex in more land okay, that kind of helps with your tax rolls today. But again, you're taking on the obligation of additional, most likely sprawled out uh, infrastructure. Again, all those roads, all those sewer pipes, all that water, all the utilities. Yeah, exactly. And it creates greenfield development, which Chattanooga has a lot of brownfield because of that and that cheap, quick injection of cash. You see a lot of developers that come in and make deals that say, hey, we'll build the roads. We'll build the infrastructure. You just adopted a city infrastructure once we're done and that works. But then it's the growth Ponzi scheme where 20 years from now, now we can't afford to to maintain what we have. So Chattanooga is in this really interesting moment. We're a world-class city in so many ways. We have the fastest internet on the planet. It's a public utility. Um, You as a private citizen could get 60 gigs of internet to your house. Um, And it's attracting tech companies. We host a lot of festivals and events, but we're at a decision. We're at a point where we're going to decide whether or not we're going to be a programmed based city that 
is primarily geared towards outsiders and hospitality, or are we going to become a wonderful place to live for its citizens? And as you and I know, the best places to visit are places that have gotten that second thing right. They've just made it wonderful places to live. I don't like going, um, I'm going to speak from my experience in, in Belgium. Um, you know, I love cities that feel lived in and feel like real cities. Whereas like you can go to Bruges, which is a wonderful city, but in some ways the, the, the tourist to local level is so high that it feels like Disney World. It doesn't feel like a real place. And I think that's a lesson that Chattanooga has to learn is that we can continue to focus on the small part of downtown to attract festivals and events and people, or we can make it a wonderful place to live and trust that people love visiting wonderful places. Yeah. I want to pull this graphic back up because I, I had mentioned earlier, I sort of spoke disparagingly to density and uh, oftentimes the the knee jerk reaction that that residents have, the NIMBYs have to um, to basically saying no to any increased density is that they feel like it's going to be this sudden intensification of, oh my gosh, right next to my single family home, which was built in the 1930s, is going to be a, you know, 30 story tower. And it's just going to be, it's going to destroy my, you know, sense of character to the neighborhood, but also just kind of, you know, feel like I'm you know, being dwarfed by this massive, massive tower. What What's really, really interesting is there's a place and a time, you know, for those residential towers and that situation. For us in Austin, that's very much in our downtown area where we have a vibrant uh, situation where we do have residential towers that have now been built, uh, which is a complete turnaround for the city. 20 years ago, nobody was living in downtown except for the the, the neighborhoods, you know, within walking, biking distance from there, uh, which I happen to be in. I happen to be a, a very, very comfortable five-minute bike ride from the downtown uh, area of Austin, Texas. But now we have a plethora of towers that are there too, matching with the towers of the business district and the music district and all of the other you know things that are happening, which are cool and hip and fun in the downtown area. That's not what we're talking about here, though. The incremental intensification. And what I like to call gentle density and missing middle housing uh, is what we're so lacking in in our, you know, in our environments here in North America. Walk us through this this particular slide and why you wanted to share this with the audience. Yeah. So for those listening, there's this on the left hand side, it says incremental intensification and it shows houses and then it shows the houses getting a little bit bigger and then buildings filling in the empty space. And then you see some like short towers and houses mixed together. And then the sudden intensification shows houses and then giant apartment blocks. Um, the reason I show this is I like asking people what they're worried about their neighborhood becoming. And a lot of times it's soulless, person, personality-less buildings that seem to pop up um, in growing cities and towns across America. And then I want to ask the follow-up question is, why do you think those pop up? And it's almost always going to be a very, not necessarily untrue, but a very simple answer of like greedy developers or business owners that want to maximize their profit. But then I want to ask a follow-up question and say, okay, why are they doing that now? And why didn't someone do something smaller earlier? And that question is where people kind of get stumped. And the answer is, if you don't like big, ugly buildings, we actually need to loosen restrictions because what happens is the restrictions build up a need that's so great when the dam breaks, you have these big buildings. I think Austin is a perfect example. People talk about Austin and Minneapolis far from being affordable places. They're a lot more affordable than if they didn't build the way they've been building in the last few years. But also that Austin is probably an example of there being an intense need um, and there wasn't an, a, a sort of pathway for incremental development for the decades up until that need. 
That's very, that's very well said because really what we have seen here in Austin on the ground until some recent changes by city council to allow a little bit more of the incremental intensification that we see on the left, what we were pretty much the only thing we were getting was that sudden intem- intensification, which just spurs even more resistance from, you know, from the not in my backyard group because they, they don't want that. They, they didn't want the feeling like they were going to suddenly, their neighborhood was going to suddenly go from single family housing to we're going to have a whole bunch of five over ones, you know, right next door. Um, and so what's happened recently is, you know, some some moves by city council to actually make it a little bit more feasible and legal to be able to do those two middle steps that we have in this particular um, in, in, incremental intensification diagram. And let me give you a personal example of this. Across the, I'm in an old historic neighborhood and across the street from my house was a parking lot when I moved in. And there was a zoning hearing, uh, it was gonna get turned into apartments and everyone in my neighborhood was against it except for me. Now, what got built is a little ugly and not preferable to most people, but um, uh, Peter Peter Katz, uh, who is one of the founding members of CNU, was in town and he came to a front yard hang at my house and he pointed something out I didn't notice. He said, look at all the houses that are built 50, 100 years ago. They're all set back a similar amount from the street, but there was no... There was no zoning that told them to do that. They're all elevated a certain amount from the street. He said, that means if you're walking around your house without your shirt on, you actually still retain some privacy. So you'll keep your blinds open. He goes, let's look at the bottom floor of those apartments. The windows are so low that whoever um, inhabits that will probably close the blinds one day to get privacy and never open them again. And the effect of that is Um, There's less eyes on the street. There's less of a gray area between the public and private space. There's less of a welcoming and inviting in of community and noticing what's happening on the street and going and joining that, whether it be good or you're trying to stop something bad. And something he pointed out I hadn't thought of is that the height restrictions of that apartment force that developer to say, well, if I can only do 35 feet, the only way to get three floors worth of apartments in here is to cram you know, as low as I can and as high as I can. And so what I would like to point out to people now that Peter had pointed that out is to look at it and say, hey, you know, part of what makes us ugly is its proportion, is its window placement. And a lot of that was decided not just by the economics of how can I get the cheapest building in here, but what will the city allow me to put in here? And then I can contrast that with another apartment building just down the street. It's a courtyard apartment. It looks like it belongs in Chicago. It's beautiful. And then I show them this is illegal to build um, in our neighborhood right now, mostly because of parking requirements. But the buildings that we love, we've made illegal. And the buildings that we we hate are just the, the one of the reasons they are buildings that we hate is the hoops they've had to jump through to come into existence. Yeah. I went back to our um, comparison here uh, between, uh, you know, the two different uh, contexts with the 2000 feet, uh, the Victor Dover um, comparison side by side photos. And the reason why I wanted to come back here is the other thing that we hear, you know, from the people who are resisting um, gently densifying their neighborhood is they're that they're so fearful that it will be traffic Armageddon. And, you know, it, it's, oh, the increased traffic, the increased car traffic. I don't want any more neighbors. I don't want any more people here because I'm, you know, I'm feeling like it's going to be a nightmare from a traffic uh, perspective. And y- you can understand that response if the only thing that you're ever used to is the scenario on the right, which, of course, is this, the 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 you know, less dense development pattern where every trip is a car trip. So it, it, you, you kind of understand you're just a little bit of empathy there for where they're coming from, because the only thing they know is drive everywhere for everything versus the reality is, is if you do have what's on the left here, you've got a whole lot more choice and freedom from a mobility perspective. Your journey might be a walk. It might be a bike ride. It doesn't have to always be a, a car ride. And that's something, whenever someone brings that up, is like the parking, the traffic, it'll be a nightmare if we do this. One thing that I'm not, I don't want to shy away from is to be delusional because there is going to be growing pains. If we allow for 
for buildings to show up in a car only society, there will be traffic jams. There already are traffic jams. Um, but what I like to ask people, so first in my neighborhood, what, when I was talking to my community about these new apartments going in, as I said, look, when people say traffic, they usually mean two things, congestion or safety issues. Which are you most worried about right now? And it's safety. It's people running through stop signs. And then, so I tell them, when we have more people using the street to get home, there will be more congestion, which will slow down the cars dramatically. So one, there are little wins like that where you can communicate. We prefer the congestion type of traffic to a speedy type of traffic. And then my next question is also a follow-up that just says, um, if traffic is bad and there's a grocery store within walking distance and there's one within three miles of driving, the choice to go to that walking distance grocery store didn't just save you time. It also uh, was something loving you spared your neighbor of. When you go against a six mile round trip in your car, you're reducing traffic by six miles for someone else. And um, that, so that's this, that's how I kind of deal with the congestion problem is like help them imagine a world in which they don't have to take a car trip. Um, but the first question is we would almost all, um, we would almost all prefer slow moving cars on our streets to fast moving ones. And sometimes traffic can actually help that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Hey, we are out of time. So I'm going to give your uh, social media um, channels a plug here. This is you, the happy urbanist over on threads. And uh, we know that you are also out on TikTok. So folks, if you are TikTokers, be sure to pop on over. What's your handle over there? So yeah, it's a uh, John John dot MP4. So, um, but if you, if you search the happy urbanist on TikTok, I'll come up. And then you're also again here on Instagram. So be sure to uh, pop on over there folks and uh, see John John on Instagram. He's got uh, some other really cool stuff out there. Uh, again, uh, great content creator. How, what's your, what's your process workflow like in trying to get uh, content out? Is that a, a, a constant thing that you're uh, trying to kick out? Yeah, great question. I'm usually getting out uh, two to three pieces of content uh, a week. And um, usually it really, I might be chewing on something for weeks before it comes out. It might be something I film the spur in the moment. But my main process is taking ideas that are already out there and then coming up with anecdotes, analogies, and smaller words in which to communicate them so that the average person can uh, articulate what they feel when they're, when they step into uh, a city. Fantastic. And again, we're at your landing page here, your splash pad, uh, for your city council run. Uh, I, did we talk about when the election is? It's, it's not, so it's not, it's not until March. So it's an off season election. Um, we're nonpartisan in Chattanooga. Um, it's one of the unique things about our city that I really like, um, is nonpartisan races. Um, but it's also off election years, so typically there's a low turnout. And this is what I want to do is I want to change how Chattanoogans engage with democracy and I want to get more people participating rather than less. And you mentioned that it's that it's off year um, as well. Um, is it uh, by district or at large? Uh, great question. So it's by district. OK. Um, however, all districts are voted on at once. Okay. So we have nine city councilors. Um, there is a likelihood that seven of them could change because three okay. are retiring or stepping down and a few are making retirement decisions. So um, it is it is interesting that we've made ourselves vulnerable to some pretty drastic change yeah. Uh, yeah. In, a, in a given year. Yeah. And again, here is your thehappyurbanist.city website. So if you would like to have John John, you know, come speak to your community. This is how you reach out to him and uh, book him uh, as well. John John, this has been an absolute joy and pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. I have so much uh, to learn from you and your ability to just crank out content. And uh, it, it feels great to always be able to connect with you. Uh, we, we will definitely uh, share notes, swap <laughs> notes when you want to get into the YouTube world. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. That's, that's my next great hurdle. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Again, thank you so very much. And we'll see you uh, out and about. All right. Talk to you soon. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with John John. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. 
leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content I'm creating here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts. It's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org, click on the support tab, and there's several different options, including becoming a Patreon supporter. Uh, Patreon members do get early and ad-free access to all my video content, and uh, hey, every little bit helps and is very much appreciated. So until the next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.